Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thanks, everybody, for being here. And um, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody for the moment. Welcome to the folks who've just joined, Jim and Susan. So, um, the gut microbiome, what can go wrong? Well, there's a heck of a lot of things that can go wrong. So this is going to be a, <laughs> a lightning speed presentation if, I get, if I'm gonna finish this in an hour. So um, let me just launch in. So basically the, the issues that I'm going to be covering today, the gut issues, are Irritable bowel disease, which is Crohn's disease and colitis, which affects about 1.3% of Americans. Gastritis, which at some point affects about 25% of Americans. IBS, which is estimated to affect, or that's irritable bowel syndrome, which is estimated to affect 10 to 15% of Americans, which is also, I, I put it on the same line as SIBO, which stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and dysbiosis, which is just a general state of the bacteria, fungi, et cetera, in your gut being out of whack. So I'm putting that all together into the same, into the same category, and I'll explain more about that later. And then candida and other fungal overgrowths, parasites, and then leaky gut or intestinal permeability. So those are the things that I'm going to be covering. And I'm gonna go ahead and hide the video panel so it doesn't block the screen at all for anyone. Okay. So, if you are dealing with a bowel issue, you are not alone. <laughs> and a lot of times people are dealing with more than one bowel issue, I have found they often co-occur. So let's start with irritable bowel disease. Irritable bowel disease is typically diagnosed by a doctor through um, either endoscopy or colonoscopy. And it differs from irritable bowel syndrome in that you have actual physical signs of something going wrong. So um, Crohn's disease is probably the, in my opinion, the worst one because it, causes strictures and has ulcers in your intestine and it can have close off parts of your intestine and often is is the condition that will lead to bowel resections and that type of thing so it is believed that there may be a connection between crohn's disease uh and something called yoni's disease which is a cattle condition because uh, they, they believe that the, the cattle condition, Yoni's disease, is caused by MAP or Mycobacterium avian subspecies paratuberculosis. And there's potentially some evidence that there may be, that that may be in common, and so that's why they think it may be related to dairy. And uh, dairy is usually not advisable for people who have Crohn's disease. Then um, it also is associated with biofilms of combined fungus and bacteria, in particular, um, there's a researcher I interviewed for my podcast um, at Case Western Reserve, Mahmoud Ghanoum, who has found, you know, at least, at least in the petri dish, that, that, that there are, well, how to deal with these, these biofilms, which is sort of like if you picture plaque on your teeth, that's like a biofilm. So it's, it's a combination of a, a fungus, Candida glabrata, and then two bacteria, E. coli and Seracea marcinans, which seem to be causing these ulcers in. Crohn's disease, and they have a, they've developed a, <clears throat> a probiotic to kill, kill off those biofilms. There's also a genetic component to Crohn's disease. It's been connected as well with emulsifiers in foods, in particular, uh, polysorbate 80, and uh, the other one is called, let's see where I have that in my notes carboxine methyl cellulose. Um, but anything that's called a gum or something like that is, is particularly implicated in causing Crohn's disease. And are also artificial sweeteners. And then also associated with an overgrowth of the phylum proteobacteria in the gut. And I'll be talking more about that later. 
Oh, let me get into the, there we go. Okay. So in terms of treatment, and, I, and a lot of you, I have the word functional in front of it because I come from a perspective of functional medicine, which means that the, it's not sort of the typical allopathic paradigm, allopathic being like a traditional doctor. These are more about things you can change in your diet and your lifestyle and supplements and things like that, not typical pharmaceutical treatments. I'm not going to be dealing with the pharmaceutical treatments because if you see your doctor, you will no doubt be offered those. So what I'm going to be talking about in this, in this webinar are the functional treatments or the alternative treatments. And by the way, if at any point you want to say something or if there's any issues, um, you can pop that in the chat if you can locate that. Okay, uh, so the functional treatments for Crohn's disease include something called an elemental or a semi-elemental diet, and that's basically a powder that has all the nutrients you could possibly want already included. So it's basically already broken down into amino acids, into fatty acids, into uh, monosaccharides, so that your body doesn't have to do any work to digest it. And it gives your, your gut a chance to relax and just not do anything, basically. And then it also allows for some die-up of, of pathogenic bacteria and fungi because they don't really have much to eat. There's also a diet called the low-flex diet, which is also, all, like all diets that I'm going to talk about today, is done as an elimination diet to determine which foods are bothering you. So it's a low-fiber and fat diet. And so that diet has a, you know, an implementation phase where you go off of all high fiber or high fat foods, excuse me, and then you uh, slowly add them back in and see which impact you. Also, it's recommended that you eat small meals and have lots of fluids. And then I mentioned that one probiotic that's produced by Biome and I'll send, I'll send um, you know, afterwards, I'll send something to everybody with links and stuff to these, to these products that I'm mentioning. And then there's also various uh, supplements that are recommended, including slippery elm, omega-3 fatty acids, a good multivitamin, B vitamins, calcium, and vitamin K2. Moving on to irritable bowel disease, colitis. So there's different types of colitis. There's ulcerative colitis, microscopic colitis. So um, it is believed that that's possibly autoimmune, which is also a potential for Crohn's disease. Uh, there's also connection to the use of iso tretinoin, which is, uh, I think, was an acne medication, and uh, basically consists of, um, so where Crohn's disease can go, it, it's basically ulcers that go deep into the layers of your intestines. Colitis is more on the surface of the intestines, so it's, it's sores that are visible, again, diagnosed by uh, typically colonoscopy, and they can be in the colon, they can also be in the small intestine. Um, whereas Crohn's is primarily in the small intestine, but it can also enter the colon. But in the differences with colitis, they're more surface level sores. And um, diet, of course, can play a role in all of these conditions. And I, I, I admit that I maybe was a little in over my head in creating a webinar about every single thing that can go wrong with the bowel. So <laughs> I, may, I may be missing some information, for example, in potential causes here with colitis. But um, but I did my best, and I'm sure that, that if this is your condition, you can follow up with more research, and I'm happy to follow up individually. Um, okay, anyway, so functional treatments for colitis include, again, the elemental or semi-elemental diet. And I should mention that that's something that you can do for, say, three or four days, or that's something you can even do up to, say, three weeks. And then it's also something that you can continue when you have a flare. So you can continue it. Um, you know, like maybe you might have one meal a day that's the elemental diet and then eat regular food, or you may have a couple days a week you eat it. So you can kind of do some portion like 70-30 or 20-80 of elemental diet versus regular food to kind of keep things in check and not have um, flares. Uh, in addition, the autoimmune protocol, which is an elimination diet that eliminates a lot of uh, typically um, problematic foods like dairy and gluten and nightshades, which are like potatoes, tomatoes, um, peppers, and eggplants. And it eliminates eggs, nuts, seeds, 
um, the list is pretty long. So that's, again, also an elimination diet where you eliminate foods and then you, for a period of time, like 30 days, and then you try, try out foods that one by one to see what actually is impacting you. Um, another diet that's recommended for colitis is called the low residue diet, where you eliminate alcohol, caffeine, carbonated drinks, dairy, raw fruits and vegetables, seeds, dried beans, peas and legumes, this sounds a heck of a lot like AIP actually, dried fruits, fruit, foods that have sulfur or sulfate, high fiber foods, meat, okay, that's not like AIP, AIP uses meat, um, nuts and crunchy nut butters, popcorn, and products that have sorbitol, like sugar-free gums and candies, and any refined sugar. In terms of um, reshaping the gut microbiome, the next step that usually would involve some type of gut testing, and we'll, as we get down more to talk about IBS and SIBO, I'll talk a lot more about testing, but doing some type of testing to see what's going on in your gut microbiome, then using antimicrobials to clean out pathogenic bacteria and fungi, and then probiotics as you reset. Um, also important with IBD is stress reduction and exercise, which good say to show that that impacts your gut microbiota and therefore the uh, state of your intestines. And then some supplements that are helpful in uh, colitis are calcium, vitamin D, a multivitamin, fish oil, and probiotics. Okay, moving on to gastritis. So gastritis, the symptoms of gastritis include nausea or recurrent stomach upset. Oh, and, and I should mention before I go on that gastritis is, is inflammation, irritation, or erosion of the lining of the stomach. And it can either occur, it can occur suddenly, so that would be acute gastritis, or you can have it over time gradually chronic gastritis. So chronic gastritis can, can actually be more serious than ulcers, and sometimes it leads to complications like anemia and even stomach cancer. But acute gastritis uh, and stomach ulcer symptoms typically go away within several weeks when you remove the irritants that are causing the problem. But symptoms are, are I'll just let you read the list. I don't need to read it to you. <laughs> So looking at causes, excessive alcohol use, chronic vomiting, stress, NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that's aspirin, ibuprofen, Tylenol. Those are actually a lot more dangerous than a lot of people realize and are connected with not just ulcers, but heart disease and bleeding and such in your stomach. So um, best to take those as little as possible. H. pylori, that's Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria that, if not overgrown and in good mixture with other things, doesn't necessarily cause problems, but is connected to stomach cancer. So you typically, if, it is, if you're having problems and it's found, uh, your doctor will put you on a course of very strong antibiotics, which will probably cause a whole host of other problems if, they're not, if it's not done correctly with probiotics used as well at the same time. So just beware if you have a H. pylori diagnosis that, that that's not, the antibiotics they give you will be very strong and potentially harmful. So you want to you wanna do that right. Um, it also can be caused by bile reflux, which is a backflow of bile into the stomach from the bile tracts, bile tract, which connects to the liver and gallbladder. And then microbial infections like bacteria and viruses. So the diagnosis would typically be done by an MD um, through your symptoms and history. Um, there's different types of tests. There's breath tests, blood tests, stool, and urine tests. And then the more invasive test would be an endoscopy with a biopsy, in particular, um, looking for H. pylori. So treatment um, basically is to remove the offending foods, which typically are acidic foods, spicy or hot foods, alcohol, caffeine, dairy, processed foods, and it looks like I put alcohol twice, and then, have, and then going to a healthier diet with lots of fruits and vegetables, high quality proteins, meaning uh, grass-fed or pastured, pasture-raised pasture um, proteins, and healthy fats like avocado, olive oil, coconut oil, um, and um, you know, omega-3 fatty acids, things like that. Um, and probiotic foods and fiber. And then also quitting smoking and reducing stress. And then the supplements that are particularly recommended in gastritis 
include vitamin C, magnesium, calcium, B12, probiotics, omega-3 fatty acids, and DGL, which stands for deglycerinated <laughs> licorice. So it's licorice root. Um, now we're getting to the stuff that's truly my um, biggest area of expertise, <laughs> which is SIBO, IBS, and dysbiosis. So SIBO, as I mentioned earlier, is called, is, stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and that's been a paradigm in functional medicine for a while, where they believe that you have an overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine, and that that is causing all of the downstream symptoms, including abdominal pain and discomfort, bloating and abdominal distension, diarrhea, constipation. Um, and so there's, there's considered, um, in SIBO, there's considered two types, SIBO C, well, three, SIBO C with SIBO with constipation, SIBO D, SIBO with diarrhea, and alternating, where you have alternating diarrhea and constipation. Um, and then cramps and gas and belching and reflux and nausea. So um, also this, these are also the symptoms of IBS. And at this point, they believe that 80% of IBS, their irritable bowel syndrome, is caused by SIBO. And of that, they believe that 80% of SIBO is caused by food poisoning. So some initial episode of food poisoning. And what happens is that you end up having antibodies that your body creates that then start attacking your migrating motor complex, which is what causes that peristalsis or the gut movement and moves food through your intestines at a steady rate and a correct direction. And when that's impacted, then you can have, in theory, an overgrowth of bacteria in a portion of your small intestine, which then starts to cause problems. And you know, if you have, if you eat and are quickly bloated, that may be a sign that you do in fact have something in your small intestines because it happens right after you eat. Whereas if it happens like a day later or you know, uh, half a day later, then, it, then you're looking at something that's more likely in your colon. And so they have found that there's actually these antibodies that kill off this migrating motor complex and, and now have a test for that. So that's one uh, potential way. Now, dysbiosis is, is when your gut bacteria is out of whack. And I'm gonna kind of go through everything and then talk a little bit more about, about dysbiosis and the, the current theory around that. So let's look first at the causes and risk factors. So as I mentioned, food poisoning, antibiotics. Um, again, antibiotics are much more dangerous than we, take, uh, than we take into account. And we often have a course of them every year, if not more than one. And usually following frequent courses, people start to have bowel issues. So it is important to, when you take antibiotics, to do it correctly and to, to take good probiotics at the same time to make sure, and then after for a period of time, to make sure that your body resets in a safe way. Um, also just an inflammatory diet, which is to say a standard American diet that consists of sugar and processed food, white flour, all that kind of stuff is gonna be a risk factor. And then um, gluten is a big risk factor. A lot of people are sensitive to it. And it also does cause opening in the um, tight junctions of your intestines and lets things out and then ultimately can lead to autoimmune diseases. And then other food sensitivities, super common ones include um, gluten, dairy, soy, eggs, nightshades. So those are some of the top ones. Autoimmune disease can also be an underlying factor that can impact um, these diagnoses low stomach acid. So that's another one. A lot of people are put on proton pump inhibitors and develop low stomach acid as a result because they have reflux. But a lot of people just, as you age, you tend to have lower stomach acid amounts. And so you may start to have trouble digesting meat and things like that, at which point you start to have problems like GERD, and then you're put on a proton pump inhibitor and you have even less stomach acid. And then what happens is you do not have the acid to kill off the um, pathogenic bacteria that you're ingesting, and then that ends up taking root in your system. And you may also not be able to kill off uh, parasites and things like that that are coming in with your food. Other medications that are potentially problematic are uh, oral contraceptive pills and um, then also moderate alcohol con consumption. So low alcohol consumption is, is 
one a day for women, two for men. So anything above that would be considered moderate. Celiac disease, um, Crohn's disease. So a lot of these things kind of co-occur. And then having had a prior bowel surgery, also types one and two diabetes and dysmotility. So you can also have electrical problems in your gut. So for example, um, if you have a concussion, because there's a communication between your brain and your gut that is moving, telling, telling your gut at what speed to move and in which direction to move, sometimes concussions can lead to that process getting messed up. And so that actually is at the root of IBS or SIBO or dysbiosis. So um, yeah, I had an interesting podcast with, um, with a, a doctor in Canada who does, who does something called an electrogastrogram to track, track the electrical signals of your intestines and if they're moving at the right hertz in the right direction because sometimes they're moving backwards in certain spots which is where you can start to get an overgrowth okay so in terms of testing um, there are a variety of options uh, one is is a new test that may actually be covered by insurance called smart gut and that actually tests for the antibodies to your migrating motor complex and that's a recent invention, just within the last few years. But that can tell you whether you have an autoimmune form of IBS or SIBO. And then um, the traditional model for SIBO testing has been these lactulose or glucose breath tests. So the lactulose, in theory, is going to test sort of the lower part of the small intestine and the glucose, the upper part. So typically, you would be given a lactulose breath test first, where they give you, you ingest this lactulose after not eating um, certain foods for a couple of days. And then they check the um, gases that come out afterwards periodically. And they're looking for methane or hydrogen. And, and that typically points to either a SIBO C with the constipation or a C with, for methane or a SIBO D for the diarrhea with uh, hydrogen. And then there's also supposed to be another one called hydrogen sulfide that they can't currently test for. And then the glucose would just test, um, it comes, it's absorbed quickly, so it would test higher up in the small intestine. So if you had a negative lactulose breath test but still had symptoms, they might give you a glucose breath test. Um, you can order the glucose one yourself. The lactulose in the U.S. has to be by prescription because lactulose is a controlled substance for some reason. So they're just sugars. So anyway, um, that whole testing model has been called into question. And I did a recent interview on my podcast with Lucy Mailing, who was talking about why that why that model is problematic. And some of the reasons that she cited was number one, that um, the, the basis of SIBO and its testing and, and that test is on, it was developed using culture, um, which is when you put something on a culture medium like bacteria and you watch it grow over the course of time. So culture-based testing, it was all, all of these tests were based and validated by cultures. And that whole testing model has been passed over now that we can run DNA on our gut bacteria and actually know exactly which microbes are in our gut. And so that's, and, and what they've discovered, of course, in doing so is that what grows in culture, of course, are aerobic bacteria or bacteria that can breathe oxygen and they tend to overgrow. And then you get this, oh, okay, yes, you're overgrown by this, with this particular bacteria. And then of course the anaerobic bacteria don't do so well in the presence of oxygen. So basically what is happening is you're, all of this, this was all developed with, with bad testing as the paradigm. So now the other issue too is that those tests, they occur typically over, I think, two or three hours. And what they're assuming is that it takes a certain amount of time for food to pass through your small intestine and into your large intestine. But the problem is for most people, the rate of movement is very, quite variable. So you may have somebody whose food is in their large intestine in 45 minutes and someone else who isn't in it in five hours. So really what they don't actually know if what they're seeing is coming from the colon, the gases that are coming out are from the colon or the small intestine. So, um, and then the other piece is that there was a recent study that showed no correlation when they actually did bio, they did endoscopies and actually sampled what was in the small intestine and correlated it with the lactulose breath test. There was no correlation at all. So it, so it sort of invalidated that test. 
So there's, I mean, it was just one study, but that's why that whole model is being called into question. So I think better ways to test for um, dysbiosis, for SIBO, for IBS, include microbiome sequencing, which um, if you do the um, metagenomic sequencing, which is the newest technology, you are literally down to the strain level, finding out every single bacteria and fungi, virus, parasite, et cetera, that's in your gut um, and in what um, amount. And then um, the organic acids test is another good test for seeing what's going on in the gut. It, it doesn't show everything about bacteria, but, but it basically tests a, from your urine the metabolites or the essentially the byproducts of the bacterial metabolism or the fungal metabolism. And it will check for um, fungal metabolites like um, candida or an aspergillus. And it will test for bacterial metabolites for certain families and certain bacteria, in particular the Clostridia, which if overgrown can cause problems. Like if, you've, if you're familiar with C. difficile, that's Clostridia difficile. So that's a particularly problematic, um, problematic overgrowth. And, and it also, the organic acid test also includes a heck of a lot of other interesting information about your neurotransmitters, your B vitamins, um, vitamin C, and it can give you a lot of information about what's going on in your body. Uh, okay, I seem to have a couple random things that don't belong on the testing screen. <laughs> we'll move down to the next page then. So in terms of treatment, um, okay, actually, you know what, let me, let me talk now about, about something called the oxygen gut dysbiosis theory. So this is a theory that, um, you know, as I said, the, the whole model of SIBO as being what's really going on, is it really an overgrowth in your small intestine, um, has been called into question. And the new theory is this oxygen gut dysbiosis theory where a lot of these symptoms that people are having might actually be being caused by uh, something different. And so basically it goes like this. Your colon, your large intestine, is supposed to be devoid of oxygen. It's supposed to be anaerobic. And when it gets inflamed, um, it leads to problems. So in an anaerobic environment, you'll have um, certain bacteria that do well in anaerobic environments that cannot be in the presence of oxygen. And those bacteria typically, um, well, some of them produce butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid as a byproduct of their metabolism. And butyrate feeds the lining of the gut, the cells, the gut epithelial cells. And what happens then is when you get gut inflammation from various causes, the, and the if epithelial cells are inflamed, they will start to leak oxygen into the gut. So it'll pull oxygen from like the bloodstream into the gut. And then what happens is the facultative anaerobic bacteria, which is to say the ones that can live in the presence of oxygen, like E. coli, Salmonella and Enterococcus, they're all from the phylum proteobacteria. They will overgrow because they can survive in that oxygenated environment. And then they will start to outcompete the beneficial microbes that produce butyrate. And butyrate is important for the health of your gut lining because that feeds the gut epithelial cells and helps maintain that nice mucus layer. So, so anyway, so these facultative anaerobes will outcompete the obligate anaerobes or the ones that cannot live in the presence of oxygen. And those facultative anaerobes tend to be much more inflammatory, so they stress the gut, they cause more inflammation, more permeability, and then, so what's happening is they continue to inflame the gut epithelium, which again then leaks more, more oxygen, and then it favors them again, and you get into this vicious cycle where you have an overgrowth of proteobacteria. And that's a very typical profile in gut dysbiosis. And in fact, maybe at the root of a lot of the IBS and the SIBO that people are diagnosed with. Now, it's not to say that the treatment regimen for SIBO is incorrect, because the people who are diagnosing and treating it are probably doing the same things that they would do, whether it was dysbiosis or SIBO. So it's, but the diagnosis may be, may be off in the testing. Okay, so, oops. Um, okay, so let's look at the treatment for SIBO and IBS, and then I will stop for a second and let people ask questions. Um, so there are 
Uh, typically for SIBO, there has been something called rifaximin or IBS, um, which are prescription antibiotics. They're very expensive, like $900. If your insurance covers them, you're lucky. Two-week course of that will kill all off the bacteria just in your intestinal tract, so it won't necessarily impact your entire body. So it's not as dangerous a um, antibiotic as many others. Or you can take a, um, a series of herbal antimicrobials. So these are certain uh, herbs, and there you can some, you know, a, a naturopath might prescribe herbs, you know, and it make up a tincture. Or there are also many products sold through supplement companies that are combined products that that are, you know, have have been standardized and tested for getting rid of uh, gut bugs. And then also, in addition to that, partially hydrolyzed guar gum is recommended to, to um, ensure the success of those regimes. And then for recurrent SIBO or recurrent dysbiosis, where, um, there, where you, and in, in particular, if you know that you have that, if you took the smart gut test and you know you have antibodies to your migrating motor complex, it's recommended that you take a prokinetic, which is a medication that causes your gut to keep moving. And it's not the same as a, um, what's the word for constipation? <laughs> you get like Metamucil. It's not, it's not like that. It's not meant to move your large intestine. It just keeps your intestines moving and keeps things moving through your small intestine. So that sometimes is something you have to go on for life. Then also the low FODMAP diet is recommended for people with SIBO and IBS. And that is, stands for, Fructo or no, it's fructans, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols, which are basically sugars in your food that bacteria feed on. And so typically, you, when you go on a FOD, low FODMAP diet, you will see a big relief of symptoms. And some of the big FODMAP foods are like garlic and onions. And um, it's sort of a, a random array of foods, some of the vegetables, some of the fruits. You know, a lot of it is the healthy food. And it's not a treatment, which is to say, if you go on a low FODMAP diet, you might be fine for a while, but then you'll also be losing some diversity in your gut bacteria as you reduce all of these. Um, you're essentially reducing all of these um, prebiotics or the fiber that bacteria feed on. So you don't want to stay on it for long. It's, it's meant to be an elimination and reintroduction process or for relief of symptoms as you do in the actual treatment by using the herbal antimicrobials or the prescription antibiotics. And then if you do know that you have an overgrowth of proteobacteria, you've done some type of a gut sequencing. Um, I know that, that two that definitely will work for that are the longevity gut sequencing. These are, these are consumer-facing tests. You can order them yourself. So the longevity is a metagenomic sequencing, and Biome, B-I-O-H-M, is a um, 16S. Uh, testing, which is a little bit older technology that's not quite as precise, um, but that will tell you at least what your proportion of proteobacteria is. So if you know that you have this, this profile of overgrowth of proteobacteria, which can cause basically all of the things we've talked about so far, perhaps except well, even including gastritis, pretty much everything we've caused before, may, talked about before may be related to an overgrowth of proteobacteria, every one of these gut conditions. So the treatments um, include supplemental butyrate, or if you go onto a ketogenic diet um, where you basically are eating super high fat and it produces these ketone bodies, including beta-hydroxybutyrate, beta which will also feed your gut lining instead of the fiber that feeds the gut bacteria that then produce butyrate. Um, so supplemental butyrate or a ketogenic diet, um, retinoic acid, which is uh, a form of vitamin A like retinol palmitate. Um, there's also a prescription drug that has shown promise called mesalamine, which has typically been used to treat um, IBD. And um, all of, basically all of these are something that stimulate the PPAR, PPAR gamma pathway, which I, I'm a little bit in over my head in trying to describe what that is. But in any case, these are all recommended. Um, CBD oil, curcumin, probiotics in particular, um, Saccharomyces boulardii and omega-3 fatty acids are sort of more advanced treatments if you know that you have this overgrowth of proteobacteria. Now, okay, so I'm going to go keep going to candida. So 
Candida is a yeast. And so we naturally have candida in our guts. That is a normal um, part of our gut microbiome in the ratio of around three to five percent of the fungi in our gut. However, it can overgrow and symptoms of that are um, all of these here. And um, obviously women are familiar with yeast infections. So typically, you know, if you go on antibiotics to get a yeast infection, that may be indicative of the fact that you are, um, that you have an overgrowth of digestive candida. So we're talking about the candida the digestive tract here. So a lot of the symptoms of, of these things can be in common. And in my experience, that people who have overgrowth of bacteria typically have overgrowth of candida as well. Like almost everybody who I've, I've run an organic acids test on will have both of those things. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of over, overlapping that when you get dysbiosis and, to, you know, one of the primary causes, let me go down to the next screen. Um, oh, I didn't really talk about causes, did I? Okay. Well, one of the primary causes of candida is, is antibiotics. So you take antibiotics, it kills off bacteria, bacteria undergrow, candida, candida overgrow. So that's a real common um, scenario. So in terms of testing for candida, um, you can go on symptoms, of course. If you're dealing with bacterial overgrowth and, and fungal overgrowth at the same time, you may just want to um, assume that there's candida and um, but the organic acid test will actually show you the metabolites of the fungi and of other molds like aspergillus in your gut and of also like fusarium um, which are corn fungi fungus and then you can also do antibody testing which at least can point to whether you have um, you know recent infection or a long existing infection and whether your immune system is actually reacting to it, which shows that it's functioning. But alone is probably not a good enough test. And then you also have stool testing. Uh, the biome test will tell you what proportion of candida you have and um, like longevity, the, the metagenomic sequencing will also tell you that. And then um, in terms of treatment, you, there's a possibility of the prescription antifungals like nystatin or herbal antifungals. And typically candida is not quick to, you don't get rid of it quickly. It's something that you have to treat over the course of many months, especially if you're going the herbal route and nystatin isn't all that successful, to be honest. So um, the herbal route, and what's nice about herbal, herbal things is that they deal with bacteria and they deal with parasites, they deal with fungi, they kind of deal with everything at the same time because these, you know, these things develop in nature to protect themselves from all the same inputs that we have. So, um, so, and then in addition to that, you want to go on a diet that doesn't have much of the food that would feed candida, like sugar or simple carbohydrates. So basically, you're going on a, a low, low simple carb diet and a, and a low carb diet in general. And then um, probiotics, of course, are important as well. So, okay, let's go to the next page. Parasites. So, excuse me. Um, parasites uh, are something you might want to suspect if you have a history of traveler's diarrhea or a history of food poisoning. And if you have an unexplained constipation, diarrhea, gas, or other symptoms of IBS, um, some symptoms that are a little bit unique to parasites are trouble falling asleep or waking up multiple times during the night skin irritation or unexplained rash, hives, rosacea, or eczema, grinding your teeth in your sleep, pain or aching in your muscles or joints, fatigue, exhaustion, depression, or feelings of apathy, and then never feeling satisfied or full after meals, and a diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. So testing for parasites, you know, you can go to your doctor and say, I think I have a parasite, but unless you have recurrent diarrhea, over the course of a couple of weeks, your doctor's not likely to order a test for you. And some of the things that are on a typical parasite test through, through like, you know, your lab core and your quest are not going to be considered parasites, but are now considered parasites by the functional medicine community some of the time. So um, 
One parasite testing service that I recommend is called Para Wellness Research, and you can order that yourself. And I interviewed him on one of my podcasts as well. And he will also check for candida. And he really, you know, was like an expert in parasites, trained by the U.S. Army, did it in Vietnam. So um, at once he retired as a doctor, he decided to, uh, to offer this service because he knew how bad the parasite testing was through typical labs. And then, um, again, the metagenomics tool sequencing, like longevity, will also tell you if you have parasites, at least in the raw data. And if, you have, if they find something really bad, then they will have a doctor actually call you. In terms of treatment, um, antibiotics or herbal antimicrobials, and again, probiotics. Okay, leaky gut. <laughs> this is like the parent of all, for the parent or the child of all gut issues. So pretty much leaky gut co-occurs with almost all of these gut issues. So if you have IBS, you probably have leaky gut too. If you have SIBO, if you have um, colitis, Crohn's, et cetera. So leaky gut or intestinal permeability is basically where you have food, partially digested food, um, parts of bacterial bodies, um, like called lipopolysaccharide or bacterial, what they call bacterial endotoxins, um, escaping out of, and then also just toxins like pesticides and the things that come in with your foods, escaping out of your gut lining and into your body, at which point then you have an inflammatory response that's going to attack it. And, um, and that can lead to autoimmune diseases and, and problems. So the symptoms are many. Virtually anything that can go wrong in your body could be related to leaky gut. So especially a lot of the chronic diseases. So, um, you know, thinking about um, the obesity-related metabolic diseases, like fatty liver and type 2 diabetes and heart disease, like Parkinson's disease, all of those can be related to leaky gut. So I will just go to the next page and talk a little bit about the root causes. So again, antibiotics are a big root cause for a lot of the problems that people have in their gut because what they do is they kill off beneficial bacteria along with pathogenic bacteria, and then you end up having, um, you know, the gut lining basically is not as protected and then it starts to get leaky. There's also a question of a potential genetic predisposition. There's medications that can cause a leaky gut, like all of the NSAIDs, the birth control pills, steroids, the acid reducing drugs again, because they kill off, because you know, you get an overgrowth of pathogenic bacteria that can cause inflammation and then that whole leakage process. Low stomach acid can also be an issue. Um, again, parasites, food poisoning, so they coexist with a lot of these problems. Food sensitivities can also cause a leaky gut, in particular gluten. Um, just eating, again, a, a standard American low fiber diet chronic stress, toxic overload. So this can be the toxins that you're getting. Like, you know, that's another thing that appears on the organic acid test are, you know, potential metabolites of, they can point to toxins in your system, like the parabens and ethylene and things like this that are, that are chemicals that are in a lot of our stuff in our shampoo and our cleaning products and all these antibacterial hand gels we're all using now. So, um, yeah, that toxic overload just is pesticides from your food, too. Um, poor blood sugar regulation can also be at the root. And again, all of, as I said, SIBO, candida, dysbiosis can be at the root of leaky gut, too. So often treating leaky gut is about treating the other underlying conditions. So addressing if you have the SIBO or if you have IBS, if you have candida, et cetera, dealing with those infections, and then, then that essentially will help seal up the gut. You can also, if you don't have any of those underlying infections, you can also look at an elimination diet. Again, gluten dairy, very common triggers, but typically you want to do a more involved elimination diet because you don't want to go to all the trouble of not eating several things for a month and then fail to get the one that really is your issue. So the most thorough elimination diet is the autoimmune protocol. That's a little much, so I tend to use a, uh, an elimination diet that's a, a bit less involved, um, doesn't eliminate every single thing in, unless you're not getting better, in which case then I'll add on some foods. Um, if, you, if low stomach acid is your root problem, you can try betaine HCL, which is just like um, stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, and you take pills with your meals that have meat and you just keep increasing the dose until you feel this burning sensation and then once you hit the dose that gives you that, you back off by one pill, and then 
you um, use that as your dose while you're eating and typically you use that for a while and then your body starts to compensate and then you can go back off it. Um, digestive enzymes can also be helpful. Um, of course, you gotta stop taking the drugs that are causing the problem. Uh, try and detoxify your home um, in terms of the cleaning products, moving to natural cleaning products. Um, try and detoxify your diet by moving to organic foods, pastured meats, et cetera. As I say, they're expensive, but I'd rather pay it in food than pay it in medicine and life years and quality of life. And then, um, you know, other things that have toxins like receipts, they still have BPA on receipts, so you want to be careful. You wash your hands after you touch those. Um, not microwave food in plastic containers, things like that, sort of the, the low-hanging fruit. Get rid of your Teflon pans, move to cast iron or stainless steel or things like that. Um, then... Nutrient deficiencies can be another root cause of leaky gut, so um, getting testing for that. So some of the most common nutrient deficiencies are vitamin D. Uh, magnesium is very common. That's why you know, most people probably can afford to supplement with both of those, even without testing, but you should periodically test um, vitamin D for sure. And um, vitamin A is a common one, and zinc. Um, the omega-3 fatty acids, most people are, are out of whack. They have, because the uh, pro-inflammatory oils, the seed-based oils like corn oil and canola oil, those are, are typically heavier in omega-6 fatty acids. And so since they're in so many processed foods and a lot of people use them, we tend to be way dominant in that. And those are pro-inflammatory, pro whereas omega-3 are anti-inflammatory. So usually most people need to take omega-3 fatty acids unless you are, like my husband, consuming regular sardines and anchovies or salmon three times a week, or um, which would be wild caught, of course. And then um, some supplements that are helpful, L-glutamine if your issue is in the small intestine, butyrate if your issue is in the large intestine, again, because they both help feed the gut lining, probiotics. Um, in particular, there's three different kinds of probiotics that are useful, spore-based, which are like bacillus, something like bacillus coagulans. Um, then there's the lacto bifido combined probiotics. And then there's the beneficial yeast called Espilardi, which is useful in a lot of the conditions we're talking about. And then um, some of the supple other supplements that are useful, quercetin, zinc, curcumin, colostrum, aloe, slippery elm, DGL, that's that licorice root, NAG, and shilajot. Um, in particular, if you are having issues because you took too many NSAIDs. Okay. I think, whoops. Okay, so if you are dealing with some of these issues, um, there are different routes to go for getting help. Um, if, you're, if your medical stuff is very complex, a functional medicine MD is a great option, but at least here where we live, I don't think there are any of those. Um, and they usually aren't covered by insurance. Naturopaths are, are usually well-educated in gut health stuff. Um, there are some PharmDs who do work in this area, um, especially well-known ones that I, that I follow, like Grace Flew and um, Isabella Wentz, but I'm not sure. Yeah, no, some of them, some of them still see, see patients, but it's like $10,000 for a, a year of treatment with some of them. Or you can come see me. I'm a health coach, and I, uh, one of my specialty areas is coaching people on gut health. So I don't diagnose and treat disease, but I educate, and I can help you understand and interpret your labs and educate you on the protocols that different medical doctors and PharmDs and, and people out there in the gut health world who cost a heck of a lot more than me use to um, heal these issues. So if you are interested, I let everybody who wants to set up a free one-hour discovery session or breakthrough session and we just talk about what's going on with your gut health and what you would like to have going on and um, how to get there. And so um, if you're interested in signing up for that, I will follow up with everybody unless I can figure out where the chat is because I have yet to do that. Let me pull this up here. Okay, there we go. Now I can pull up the chat. Okay, I'm gonna pop um, a link in the chat. Okay. Actually, I'm going to pop three links in the chat, and then I'm going to unmute so we can ask more questions. Uh, so the first link is 
a link for a break, setting up a breakthrough session where you can just go to my calendar and set it right up, and that's free. Um, I also have a gut health coaching program that consists of five appointments with me, and typically you would also order your own test, and we would um, go over those, and I'd explain what some of the protocols are to reverse your gut condition. And then the third link is for a functional health and nutrition review, which is just like a one-hour, one-off appointment with me to talk about all of your gut issues and health issues. And I, you know, this is typically for somebody who's kind of been down the path many times and they haven't yet found solutions, but they just, just want to know if there's anything I know that they haven't yet looked at or figured out. So, um, or can't, you know, finance a whole, a whole course of um, gut health coaching. So that's another option. So those are three links there. And let me go ahead and unmute everybody and see if anybody has any questions. Um, I am not seeing the links in the chat. We're not. Okay, well, I will follow up via email w to everybody with all this stuff, so. Did you, you did you hit enter, put the links in? I often don't. Oh. <laughs> Thank ha -ha. you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> this is my first Zoom webinar, and I'll have you know that my only practice was for about 10 minutes with my son <laughs> about an hour ago, so. Not bad. <laughs> I think it was pretty good for, for my first Yeah, one. definitely. Technology-wise. <laughs> Any questions? And you can also pop it in the chat if you just, and just to me, if you don't want everybody to see that you're asking. Mike, I have another question. What do you do if you're very sensitive to all probiotics? Okay, so I definitely have heard that from people. So um, some people, well, there's, so there's three different types of probiotics, right? So maybe you've tried the lacto bifido. There's also um, some probiotics that produce histamines, which is like what causes allergic reactions. So sometimes what you need is a low histamine probiotic. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the, some of the lacto bifida ones that I recommend um, are low histamine and typically the ones that I start people with. Then the other um, type of probiotic, the uh, spore based, a lot of people haven't tried those. That's like mega spore biotic or pro flora for our just thrive. Or it may be that you have to titrate up really slowly. So sometimes with mega spore, for example, they would say just take like a quarter of a capsule and every two days and slowly titrate up because sometimes what's happening is you're having so much change because that stuff is really effective that you're getting die off. So it's killing off candida, it's killing off bacteria. So mm -hmm. you need to take um, what's called a, a binder which typically whenever you do the herbal antimicrobials, you recommend a binder too, which I should have had on the slide, um, which is like um, activated charcoal or a clay binder or something like folic humic acid. So you would um, have that binder collecting up the byproducts of the die off. So you don't have that Herxheimer reaction or that um, die off reaction. Okay, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Thank you all for joining me. And if you have any other suggestions for topics, I'm open. I, um, I, I typically work with people around autoimmune disease and reversing autoimmune disease, which I did myself, and gut health and weight loss. Those are the typical things that I coach people on. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.